Creative Happy Hour. I'm Karina. And I'm Micah. And we are going to be talking about getting drunk on the creative possibilities. So on this episode, we are going to be talking about that age old battle mm. of um, intellect versus pop culture, of um, the Manhattan versus the Cosmo. The Cosmo. And uh, Dorothy Parker versus Sarah Jessica Parker, right? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and um, J.R.R. Tolkien versus J.K. Rowling. Rowling. So we think it's a battle for the ages. We think a lot of people <laughs> get kind of stuck when they're thinking about building a new creative life for themselves or trying to choose a creative direction. I think that people get intimidated about this obligation of the intellect or maybe they get too kind of caught up in pop culture and think that they need to be doing something that's trendy or trend driven. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of talk about all these things through the lens of alcohol Art. Yeah, <laughs> right. and, uh, and we'll see if we can get somewhere in that whole um, age old question. No, right? I think it's great. So there we go. So we tossed a coin before this and we um, got the Manhattan came first and we actually decided to choose drinks that were a little bit counterintuitive to us. I'm a lot more pop culture driven, I think. So she would therefore be more of a Cosmo girl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not really in what I like to drink, but definitely in the way that I approach things, I think. And Micah would be very much more of a, a Manhattan, Manhattan girl. girl. There you go. Yes. So we shall start with the history of the Manhattan. Love it. Which, lucky for Do me. Do you want me to hold that for you? It's freezing. I know. It's ter <laughs> I know. You're like, I want that. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, I'm going to taste it actually right now. Okay, yeah. Let me know first, how it is. Yeah, because you made it. I made I'm, these in our she's, pseudo bar. She's our amateur mixologist. You'll notice yes. that her Cosmo is a little on the red side. I think it's a California Cosmo. This is a California Cosmo because it has natural cranberry as opposed to the typical ocean the spray. The ocean spray that you would be Which using. is the way that God created it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right, just, I'm gonna try this. Yeah, well. you try that. You try that, and I'm. Mm. Is it fresh and lovely? It it is. I mean, it's not as sweet as it as, it as I be. remember as them at be. that college bar that I went to that one time. It's not in as the sweet. 90s. I'm sure, and and this is definitely not what I would have drunk at the Sex in the City movie marathon that I have <laughs> attended in the past. But um, but yeah, no, this is so. This is kind of very balanced, and I'm. Really interested, like, so I was reading about the history of this thing. The Manhattan, named after the most intellectual borough of the most intellectual city mm. in, in the country, I think. I mean, I think Who we can argue. Love? Yeah, yeah, New York, New York, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. So that's where they made this cocktail. <laughs> and the funny thing about it is that this story of this cocktail is very much of a myth. So, you know, we're going to be talking later about Lord of the Rings and everything, which has a lot of mythology mm. elements. It is hard to pin down the actual history of the Manhattan. So a lot of people said it was invented at the Manhattan Club, which was a famous bar mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and that it was uh, created for a luncheon hosted by Winston Churchill's mother. Of course. Right, but it can't be true. Well, I mean, it could be, but she was pregnant and in Europe at the time. Thinking, no. Yeah. Mm, she wasn't that's not drinking true. whiskey drinks. She was not drinking whiskey drinks at all. So uh, then the story kind of migrates through a bunch of different bars, mm -hmm. but a lot of the people who uh, made them in the early days, and this drink is, you know, very, very old, like, you know, 1800s old, older than the Negroni old. Oh. Like, it was older one of the... Older than the Negroni. Yes. So it's one of those original, like, 1890s pre-prohibition, um, you know, early, early vermouth drinks, actually. It's one of the original Grandmaster vermouth oh, drinks. I love vermouth. Right? Which is which is good. This kind of, this is what kind of makes it be okay for me, I think, is the vermouth. <laughs> it makes it tolerable. <laughs> it does, yes, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and the other funny thing about this drink is that it's had a few permutations over time, mm -hmm. but um, it's also one of those drinks that doesn't require a fancy alcohol to make it. So what are the ingredients of this? So I have to uh, go back and remember. So definitely the vermouth that we mentioned, yes, the sweet, sweet vermouth. vermouth. Um, there is a rye whiskey element, but mm -hmm. bourbon is acceptable. And like it can be when, when it was prohibition, like they'd make it with Canadian 
right? Uh -huh. So and it, you, didn't you say originally they were using moonshine? Yeah, they used moonshine for some of them. That was called something else. I think that was the uh, blonde Manhattan. Is that oh yes, it? yeah. Or, wait, so, that was with absinthe. No, 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 that was know. a different one. Yeah, no, but that was the Blonde Manhattan, I think. And the Blonde Manhattan, so you'll notice that there's a, a maraschino cherry in this one. Um, and I can tell you the history of that one, but the Blonde Manhattan has no cherry. Oh. So I'm like, oh. Well, oh, you know us blonde. Oh, well, hello there. So, <laughs> Losing yeah. fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we've got the whiskey, we've got the vermouth, we've got the bitters. So. Oh, yes, the bitters famous Angostura bitters or any other kind, really. I mean, that's the thing about this. It's not really a precision operation. No, <laughs> especially not in our kitchen. No, tonight. especially not in our case. But it all ends up kind of okay. If you don't have a cherry, you can add some orange slices or whatever. It still essentially counts. And then you've got other versions like the Tijuana Manhattan, which I'm like, well, that's not Manhattan, oh. is it? Which is made with tequila oh. or, you know, you've got all, all kinds of different types variations right so but what's funny is that unlike your drink and you'll be talking about the mystique of the cosmo and who drinks it and the celebrities who've been spotted ordering them and this and that i really <laughs> thought when i was thinking of the manhattan i was thinking oh my god i'm sure all these intellectuals of the day were probably sitting around the algonquin you know round table mm. trading barbs and insults and drinking manhattans well, that's not really the case. Like none no. of them did. That's yeah. I mean, I just see like brown leather and smoky rooms sure. and like top so, hats and well, and there you would be right actually because oh. they so the, they they moved the whole epicenter up to the Waldorf Astoria, which was owned, I believe, or at least uh, managed by mm. J.P. Morgan. Oh. So far from actually being this like intelligentsia drink, it was more of the Richie Rich drink. It was mm. more of that bad boy finance top hat hotel bar kind of mm. dudes isn't that funny so yes. jp morgan is the only actual celebrity um that i can think of who would actually drink these as a favorite drink oh, okay. um even winston churchill whose mother uh, you know apparently launched it never had that he would drink whiskey for breakfast but he wouldn't have <laughs> absolutely true yeah, but he I, I have more fondness for him yeah than all I of a sudden good old winston now all good of a sudden old, yeah it's like, good old winston wow. um but yeah. yeah no so he didn't drink them and none of the intellectuals f scott fitzgerald you know none of these people that you think of as swilling these drinks actually did it and so then dorothy parker who was the one that i hoped would drink them she didn't drink them she did not she what actually did she drink well, she mostly, so she drank gin a lot. She drank scotch a lot. She actually didn't like gin at first. So at first, when she started out as a kind of innocent little girl mm -hmm. about New York, she was not drinking much. But then the people she hung out with were total alkies, including the men that she hung out with. And so then she started, you know, imbibing and she had, you know, the scotch, you know, kind of black holes she would go through. I think she called it the scotch vapors or the scotch something oh, miss yeah. oh the scotch i get mists. those all the time the scotch mist it was those. like she just what what happened you're to in me? like the like peat bog exactly and she was can't bogged, get out. bogged down <laughs> you know exactly so she's a little bit lost but her drink well she had a few you know fun quotes about drinks and she had the martinis that she mentioned mm. um and with the martinis she was like i i like a, a mark i'll drink a good martini or i like a good martini two at most, three I'm under the table, four I'm under my host. And I was like, that is very cute. It is um, really cute. And it's quite a good quote about sex in the city. Mm. And so when we say sex in the city, we'll go from one Parker, Dorothy Parker, to Sarah, to Sarah Jessica, Jessica Parker, Parker. Uh, sex in the city fame. And so I'll let you I mean, I know I'm not as skinny and um, <laughs> my drink is a little more red. And your shoes are, I'm yeah. sure, just as fabulous. We can't see them, so it's, yeah, you know. It's better that way. <laughs> uh, so, yes, the Cosmo. We think of the Cosmo <laughs> as I'm gonna try easy, one. pretty, it's a little red. thoughtless. Thoughtless, yeah. Mm -hmm. You you see, you know, you you always see someone holding it in a pretty glass. It's a pretty mm -hmm. pink color. It's like more of like an you, accessory. Like you hold it like this. Yes, yeah, like, we don't have um, uh, martini Cosmo. glasses. But we Cosmo. don't. I know. We're and it's poor. almost like an Help ornament or an accessory. <laughs> yes. And and so you know, you're holding it as an accessory at yes. a very fancy bar in mm -hmm. New York City or wherever you are on Sex in the City, and that's City. kind of what you think of when you exactly. think of the Cosmo. It's 
history is a little bit um I, I had never heard of it before Sex and the City, I have to tell you. Like I thought it was I had this never heard of it either. novelty, right? Yeah, and that that Sex and the City is what made it really popular mm -hmm. because in the late eighties, early nineties, this drink became kind of a big deal. In clubs There's, and everything. I mean that's tons of people were drinking them and they were yeah, they didn't look like this, but they did taste like this. <laughs> so it started out originally in, I guess, 1968. There was mm. um, this, well, Ocean Spray, cranberry juice. The cranberry was, juice that God intended for the Cosmo. Yes, that's yes. The, the God intended cranberry <laughs> juice. That They put a little, so they were trying to drive sales more to adults. So they put, a little recipe, <laughs> they put a little recipe on the side of the cranberry box or mm -hmm, bottle mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. basically um was called the harpoon the drink was originally called the harpoon very northern whalers you know yeah. Cape cod kind totally. of connotations i see very, yeah I, see. The I like it the harpoon and um moby dick is just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah harpoon baby <laughs> yeah so the, they put it on the side of ocean spray cranberry juice and it was cranberry juice lime and vodka that minus the Contro. Oh, I like so, it with the Contro. I think the Contro gives it that little Yeah, so it yumminess. was a little bit later, mm -hmm. um, you know, Sex in the City, late 80s, early 90s. And I can't believe it was that long ago. It's a little fuzzy who, <laughs> but, but the guy that gets the, um, there's a bartender, Tony Ciccini, that gets the credit for it. He kind of, Always an he Italian. introduced it, yeah. 1987, he okay. introduced it to um, the Odeon, in yeah, the Manhattan there. Tribeca course, yeah. neighborhood. Still there. It's still there. And so that's where it's still cool. Like the Odeon is still cooler than the Cosmo is still today. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, the true. Cosmo is pretty much over. I mean, it's like yeah, after the it is. after the eighties like, yeah. and the nineties. I mean, it, it after never this, really, we're not gonna have this. One I'm never having one again. I mean, let's be <laughs> honest. Um, yeah. So it it became popular. Sex in the City. Um, it became. I mean, why do you? It kind of changed cocktail culture, though, because. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, and it's interesting to think of in a creative way because here's something that was trendy. Consider yeah, it was very, part, very much a part of pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, in like, this, do we think the color? Because we talked about this uh, on a previous episode about the pink color. Like, yeah, the that pink was color. Kind of it was like to, carefree. It was right. pretty. Mm -hmm, it was, mm -hmm. you know, it became popular in Miami Beach. It was um, very popular with gay. Oh, gay men. Miami um, Vice. Miami Vice. Mm, I, I mean, you still... always, yeah, you could always mm -hmm. see a woman drinking a Cosmo in Miami Vice. Uh, 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 so uh, it, yeah, it became very popular, and but you know, it did change kind of the the general culture of of drinking cocktails. Well, it was very feminine too. I think that yes. the Sex and the City is a very girl power kind of you know story, and I guess that maybe that was that whole that was one of those thing, right? yeah one of those waves of. Mm -hmm. Feminism. I I don't know Which, that I would yeah, call maybe, Sex in the City yeah, feminism, no, maybe but, misguided. Yeah. but yeah, a little mm -hmm. misguided. But you know, they were definitely playing on that for sure. But so. what, what interests me is that Sarah Jessica Parker's character in Sex in the City is a writer as well. Yes, right? she's I mean, a writer, yeah. and she's pretty much writing the story that you're watching, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in right in which, front of yeah. you, which is an interesting construct, which. I don't know if that had been necessarily done before. It probably had, actually. I think mm. bonf uh, Bonfire of the... No, not Bonfire of the Venice, but I know... That, well, F. Scott Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, it's a very great Gatsby-esque. I mean, don't it you think... It is kind of great Gatsby-esque. It's got that kind of, yeah, decadence and the writer, the documenter who It does. It you is. Know, yeah, now that I'm things. thinking about it, yeah. And so she's, she's creating right in front of your eyes through her writing, um, I, I would say what seems to be to her kind of a meaningful life where she's making meaning out mm -hmm. of this, you know, this mysterious relationship that she's in yeah. and her friendship. Well, it's a and, moment in time. And they're too. in this period of time yeah. where and women women are, you know, they're more out in the work uh workforce, um, more career driven. Not quite Mary Tyler Moore, but kind of like you yeah, know, and, post. <laughs> and they're grappling with this idea that, you know, if you're not married by thirty, you know, we're we're st you know they're still kind of grappling with that right 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 yeah and so and then there's this whole carefree you know we do whatever we want 
we make our own money, we have our own places to live, we're right. in the big city. We spend our money the way we want. We, we do whatever what we, we want. want. Yeah. And they kind of they kind of transformed really the narrative as well. Like I think they were so pop culture and really like more than them actually representing what was actually going on at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that they kind of influenced the way women acted. Like I think the so drink too. they ordered to the way they dressed I to, think so too. where they wanted to go. Like that drove trends hugely so i thought I that was really interesting where it wasn't quite so intellectual but it did have this huge impact i think so i, I think many women were influenced by that i wasn't a huge sex in the city fan yeah i don't i, I wasn't i mean i have i to mean admit, i, I and either. i tried to watch it recently and i was just Ooh, yeah, no. very unrequited i was very unrequited i mean it, it didn't yeah that's painful i was i would have to drink six of these to at even least, get it at least no at least and i know it's kind of embarrassing so like okay, so taste wise, I mean, why do we think it was? I mean, was well, it just this easy one didn't turn. Yeah, so it's <laughs> easy. It it packed a punch. It was you know, vodka, which doesn't have a lot of flavor. It added flavor. It was a sweet drink, but I do think it was the 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 way it looked. Yeah, you know, yeah. you you held it like you know a certain way. You were usually in a group of other women. Well, I actually um, thought it was the high heel of drinks because yeah, the high heel of drinks. It, it I really love was. that. I love because that. Because really the glass when it was, and, yeah. and this is why I'm kind of glad it's not in an actual Cosmo glass. Yes, but that martini glass format. Oh for, yeah, it would be filled to the brim, and inevitably you'd be standing there and you'd be sloshing it all over everybody, and you'd feel so awkward. And it was really like the drink equivalent of teetering on the Louboutin high heels that Sarah Jessica Parker Abs is so obsessed with. Absolutely. It was were, just prolonging it, you know? They were parallel for sure. Her drink sure. and her shoes, yes. pa parallel. And yeah, and I think that that was part of its charm. You know, yes. could you hold this beautiful pink drink could you? Yes. in this graceful, sophisticated way, still getting drunk by the second get, yeah, yeah so they're and exactly not same function spill it. yeah drunkenness being the function of these drinks okay you've got a man yeah so i'm gonna try my own i want you to check it out and so i had mine on the rocks yeah i'm having mine neat because yeah, i prefer that's, that's her that's i just, like room temperature yeah um so yeah see. test it out we want your tasting now okay. <laughs> mm. and verdict Ooh, I like it. Yeah, you like I do. It? I love whiskey. I love rye whiskey. I love sweet vermouth. I actually drink it sometimes just sweet right, vermouth. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Yes. And um, I mean, who doesn't love maraschino cherries <laughs> yeah. and bitters? Oh, so yes, yeah, so I need to give you the yeah. the story of the maraschino yes, cherry. Yes, you do. Which was, you know, that whole expression, "pretty please with the cherry on top." Mm. It's because the maraschino cherry was from Damascus, of all things. Oh, yes, interesting. Damascus. And it had, it was preserved in a special way that would make it that bright color oh. and that wouldn't make it taste like crap and that would make it last longer because a cherry mm. is something that, you know, ripens so fast and then is gone. But it was extremely rare and they couldn't keep up with demand when it became this fancy thing that you would put in your drink or have as a treat. So it became kind of the treat of royalty. Oh. And so then by the time they started putting it on top of, you know, the ice cream sundaes and all mm -hmm. of this, it was kind of an imitation maraschino cherry. Mm -hmm. I think, don't you remember back when we were kids, like they would talk about the food coloring that was in it and the red number. Oh yeah. I mean, it, and you it can was... have a seizure from that. Red exactly. Dye. I mean, exactly. that's the kind I got tonight, by the way, because <laughs> Good. $3.99 versus $19.99. Yes. I was like, I no we're contest. only having one Manhattan. I we mean, this, we'll okay. this is happy hour. This is not. Happy this days. Is, and this, yes, and this, <laughs> this is not is, a this, health show. So, right. yeah. And yeah. we know that somebody is going to approach us and be like, you made that drink wrong and this looks like shit. We don't care. We don't actually, actually. care because yes. we're not. we tried to this make is, the drink. It's and, a metaphor. It's a metaphor. and Yeah, it, it's totally metaphoric. <laughs> that, that's what this whole. Eventually, once we get sponsors, like maybe we'll make them right. Yeah, I mean, you can send us some glasses so send that us we some, can... Yeah, send us some glasses. Send us a bartender. How about, like, some measuring outs Oh, my God, things. measuring cups. I mean... Shot glasses. I, I don't strainers. have any of that stuff. Any of I mean, it. I, I know it looks like we drink all the time. Which we do. We just don't do it correctly. We just don't do it correctly. <laughs> so, now that we've kind of covered the ingredients of our drinks and the mm -hmm. history of the particular drinks, I think let's delve more into the whole... How does this relate to our whole creativity discourse yes. and doing, you know, the work that goes into creating a, a creative life for ourselves and 
and deciding, you know, which direction do we want to go into? So we're thinking, you know, intellectual versus pop culture. And I know that you have so many thoughts about this. Well, yeah, the benefit versus the non-benefits. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we were talking about this the other night when we were putting this together, the Cosmo versus the Manhattan and how the Cosmo is considered less serious, it's more playful, it lacks depth. Mm -hmm. It's more about the way it looks than the, than mm -hmm. the actual, you know, the but, but ingredients. What's, but what's funny is that the Manhattan has that whole intellectual aura about it. But at the same time, I could argue that it lacks depth as well because it can be made from well, you know, whiskey. It doesn't matter. You know, it kind of survived through all of these periods of time because it actually lacked depth. Like, I think that that protected it, mm, you know, from being changed. It protected it from being overthought by some mixologist who was like, oh my God, I'm going to get my hands on this. Instead, it was just like, this is one of the basics, you know, it's basic. Yeah, it's true. You're, you're right about that. I mm -hmm. agree with you. But I think, I think the Cosmo is um, overtly... Yeah, trying. I think it was to, designed that it way. It was designed yes. that way. It's overtly, and I think that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm, we're talking mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. the subtle, you know, what you're using it for and how you're approaching something, and also how what you set out to do, I guess. Versus yeah. what, what are you what trying the, to get out of it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. and and what's the meaning? I mean, and definitely, yeah, the the symbolism of what you're doing. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of what we were talking about. Talking about. You know, the Cosmo has a playful, you know, pos the positive mm -hmm. aspect of it is it's playful. That's our glass it's, half full. It's Yeah, our glass mm -hmm. half full. It's yes. playful. It's fun. It's outgoing. It's social. Ooh, social. It's, yeah. You know, because it is. Like I said, that you know, you'd normally see like a group of women, you know, Sex mm -hmm. in the City women, and they're, they've got their Cosmo and... They're, you know, they're having fun. They're having they fun. They're not having the deep conversation no, necessarily. No, they're not sitting in a corner in a, with a candle having right. a dark, stormy dream. Right, you know? they're not judging, I think, the actual, you know, intellectual depth of what the other ones mm -hmm. are saying or mm -hmm. anything like that. So it's a very different kind of community building, I guess. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that we were talking about, Dorothy Parker, just a second ago, and the round table that they had but very unlike the Arthurian round table, where the mm. round table was meant to promote equality, Dorothy Parker's round table was just vicious. Mm. Remember? I mean, it was all about one-upmanship. It was all yeah. about who's intellectually superior to the others. Mm -hmm. So they try to outdo each other. They try to judge each other mm -hmm. and, and be super snippy. And so I thought that that was maybe the negative side of the intellectual approach? Oh, for sure. That is definitely the negative side. You know, that's the glass half empty is that the intellectual side can be too critical. It can mm -hmm. stop you from being, from even allowing yourself to do something creative to begin with. I think it's very If you overthink it, you'll just be like, oh, everybody's already done that. I mean, yeah. it, it's, there's every reason why you can't do what you want to do. You know, it, yeah, there are more reasons to not do what you want to do yeah. than there are to do it, I guess. And you know, so I think that's the that's the reasoning mind. That's the intellectual mind saying you can't do this for this these reasons. And mm -hmm. that approach isn't necessarily always good. And so, but the benefits of that are, you know, where you, you do do something and you think it through. You know, yes. maybe it's not a good idea to take naked pictures of yourself and put it on the internet. <laughs> Definitely not. Maybe Never. it is. I don't I, know. It I don't depends on what you're doing. often a good idea. No. 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 I mean, but we're just being judgy because we're intellectual. We're intell <laughs> well, we are drinking the Manhattan right now. So we'll that, that explains side. a lot. Exactly. Well, and I think that the whole pop culture and superficial side, I think that there is a kind of immediacy mm -hmm. and there's kind of this like you know it's not planned out so you can get these real gems that come from that whole like spontaneity yeah it's a moment right? in time that's yeah, what we were saying yes yeah. is that it just allows things to happen and it cracks things open mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it gets people that maybe wouldn't normally talk about certain things or yeah. or participate in certain activities mm -hmm, or fashion mm -hmm. or you know it gets them to experience something that's completely because you're just like you're kind of swept up by the immediacy rather swept than up, having yes. and whereas with the intellectual I mean I think it's always nice to have like the, the 
place of the intellectuals is to remind us of the history, mm -hmm. remind us of the context of something. Yes. And I think that we can do well as, you know, creatives. Let's say that we have the immediacy. Like when you create a fiber frequency, for example, mm -hmm. or when I start, I fiber frequency. she's got a brand new one. Mm -hmm. Look at this. So when, when you come up with something, a new project, or if, when I start writing something new or an article about something, mm -hmm. I, I get that immediate idea, as do you. Yep. And then we start going because we're like, oh, this is exciting. So we're transported by that whole like, oh my God, and this is happening and, and something that happened to me today brought this about. Mm -hmm. But then we start delving into our research a little bit more. What does this mean? Why am I making this? What do I want to yeah, say? Yeah, where with did it? this yarn come from? Yes. What is this color? Yes. You know, how do people perceive this color? What is the history of this color? What's mm -hmm. the history of this fiber? You know, I, it, I've been making a lot of shawls. Shawls are kind of like a grandma thing. Yeah, they're know? totally not. But I mean, and, now but they're, they're not. They're actually They're cool, not you anymore. Know? Yes. And, you know, we were talking about, I was talking about the knitting world, mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. you know, historically men did the knitting, you know, before they had knitting which, machines. Which you don't think of anymore. You like don't that. think of yeah, that. They no, did. Yeah, they knit yeah. the sweaters for department stores. Wow. Which, it, it was again, a man's more, job. And that's, that it was and a man's it, job. But back then it wasn't art. It was more commerce. It, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was they were making a product and mm -hmm. so then uh, and then it became you know the men went off to war and the women were were knitting socks and gloves for the war effort and then it became very functional and it also became a way of being being an activist you know ah, you you could uh -huh. you could you know participate in the war effort wow yeah, 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 yeah. even though you weren't in the the actual battle but you could participate by you know knitting socks or knitting mittens and, for and the I soldiers. Think that, yeah, and I think that a lot of people who entered into that whole pop culture discourse, who are mm. creating memes or sharing them or who are all going to see the same movie or who are all yeah. dressing in a certain way or drinking the same drink, I think that they're participating in a discourse and that there's something where it's a bonding experience, yes. you know, to, mm -hmm. to kind of be able to allow yourself to be swept up in that movement. You know, yeah, and there's benefits to and, that. And then I guess it's up to the intellectuals to then look at that and explain what's happening or to look at the roots of the movement and then kind of ruin it for all of us by over explaining over it, it, or thinking, over but, analyzing yeah, it, but, and taking all the fun do. out of it. Yes, um, yes, a little bit. Sometimes. But no, I, I think what we're both saying is that both approaches are necessary parts of the creative, absolutely, yes. the creative process. That yes. whenever you're creating anything, you have to you have to actually tap into both approaches. You do, and I, and I think that there's no guilt really involved in deciding that you're going to be more influenced or more on one side rather than the other. And just because you choose one side mm -hmm. at one point doesn't mean that you can't decide to flip flop or just kind of you know take pieces from each thing from mm -hmm. the intellectual tradition or from the you know more high art tradition or from the pop culture what's trendy right now mm -hmm. you know there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. you know and i think you're also choosing your audience as you do this and so you know if you want to be kind of more broadly appealing you know what you need to do you know you you have to realize that if things are a little bit too up here you know that broad appeal it, it might not it might not be which there. leads us to talking about um jay well yeah and that's exactly exactly jk well, rowling yes. and and jj R. 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 Tolkien. Tolkien. well because i was just about to say that right now in hollywood there's a movement of intellectual filmmakers mm. and so yeah so it takes us into film and literature so yeah this is one of the great geek battles of all time so that whole film making discussion that we segued into because we're it's that good at our structure of what we're doing <laughs> um it takes us to that biggest geek smackdown battle of recent time yes um which kind of takes into account the whole intellectual and pop culture side. it does both i, it does I think both. this is a perfect example of it both. is a great example because it kind of so these are two authors so we're talking about jrr tolkien and jk rowling two english authors who are using their initials which is a and little yeah which is funny. I mean, I think it's very, I think that obviously Rowling definitely is a fan of Tolkien. Sure. I mean, there's no way. Tolkien being the original fantasy giant, like, deity in that pantheon oh, for of sure. fantasy writers. For sure. You know, um, George R. R. Martin as well, Game of Thrones, also using initials and also very, very, very inspired by Tolkien's world building. Um, literary abilities and then both of those authors wrote 
series that then became movies. Mm. So, okay, we're going to start the SmackDown. Do you want to take one? Well, I have or? to say, I was, <laughs> you know, I was with my daughter who is a huge Harry Potter fan. That's like, right, she's as is my son. And yes. they have reread this series over, over and, and over, over and, and over. over. And in the world of, you know, fifth, grader fourth grader through seventh grader through beyond because my son's still it, yeah, obsessed through beyond. my crazy. daughter yeah. is still obsessed mm -hmm. but they are you know it, it's considered you know you're either a harry potter fan or you're the other people you know like yes. you there is an other to it defines it really defines really who you are i believe who yes. you are mm -hmm. and i also think it's the same with tolkien people as for well. sure for sure and i think the tolkien people we're kind of the Dungeons and Dragons Yeah, the geeks, Dungeons and Dragons you know? geeks. I, I would think agree with that, that Harry Potter for a time seemed like it was a little bit more accessible and universal. And in fact, like Universal Studios has that Harry Potter land, which I think... Yes. I mean, I've been there. Rabid, me too. Me too. I've been there. <laughs> um, rabid fans, like much more inclusive maybe than I mean, people Dungeons getting, and Dragons. getting, yeah. proposing to people I mean, in front of the like, castle. You, you know, the, I don't want to call it the castle. It's Hogwarts. Hogwarts <laughs> castle. Sorry, fans. <laughs> it's a school. <laughs> no, but I think, yeah. So it's, it, I mean, obviously time and place, you know, Tolkien was, it was the 1950s. It was the 1950s. And he was Very a college time. professor. Yes, academic. And yeah. But they both have these archetypal... Absolutely. I mean, you know, you good versus evil. Totally. Dark versus light. Always. And you have, you know, Gandalf and Dumbledore. Yes. Same I same, love both right? of them. Yeah. I have love huge both. crushes on both on of both them. On both of them, but they're very, very similar. They're, they're like, like these... hot bearded guys. They are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. they That's are it. total hipsters. Okay? Yeah, they, Let's they are be hipsters. honest. I won't say that to my daughter. They're but. these characters who, in the in the story, they've been around for a longer time. They have this, um, you know, whole wisdom. They have that kind of superhuman knowledge, and you know, they're an authority figure. So, and they have some self preservation at the same time. Totally, they know totally. their they're not, limits, and they're not they know their limits. The, unlike the younger. People. Right, and they're not purely good, which is, and both of those worlds I think is really interesting because it is more than the superhero stuff. These books really introduce good and evil, but with characters that are a little bit more nuanced, except for True. Sauron and Voldemort. Sure. Which are kind of really flat and just. They're just, just the bad. dark side through and through. They're I mean, just they're the just, dark side. Although they do have. You know, they do end up giving you somewhat of a backstory of, of yes, of, of what, how, the how, what, yes, yeah, journey. how did they turn dark? You know, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's always interesting, right? It is, and I think but so when you look at how these two works will compare to each other, so they both make really awesome movies, you know, obviously. But I think that reading Lord of the Rings, the whole um, you know series trilogy, whatever it is really takes a lot of time and a big commitment. I mean, you've I mean got don't you have to learn how to like speak, speak elfin or something? Elfin or something. I, mean, something. Got, I don't yeah. even know. I don't no. actually know you because I didn't read them. But. It, to me, that was a little off-putting that you really had to delve into this whole language and architecture and a glossary of names and places and all this stuff. Whereas Harry Potter's world is a lot more similar, I think, to mm -hmm. our world. Therefore, more accessible. Like kids mm -hmm. can imagine themselves kind of stepping off of the train platform onto whichever platform something I mean, I you don't need to be an elf yes. to yes. understand a story about mm -hmm. an elf. You, right. I mean, it, it's kind of, but you know what it reminds me of? I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but, but that's what it we kind do. of reminds <laughs> me of reading Russian literature. When you yeah. read Crime and Punishment, mm -hmm. Dostoevsky, I don't know if I'm saying it Dostoy correctly. Dostoy yeah. Dostoy as, I try, as I correct you, but say it wrong. Dostoy <laughs> Dust. <laughs> Maybe you should pick up the vodka Dostoyevsky. drink. Dostoevsky. Thank you. Done. So, done. Prime and Punishment. Done. Very beautiful. Well done. <laughs> Cheers. <Thank you. laughs> so, I remember reading Crime and Punishment, and so the, I'm, I'm arguing that there is a benefit to it, mm -hmm. because I read Crime and Punishment, and it's so mundane. Oh, it you is. You spend every day. It's boring. In the, it's almost yeah, boring. His it's life boring. is boring. But the when life. something happens, yes. you become the character. So you actually feel the mm -hmm. way the character Very feels. Very much so, yes. And it's it's actually unsettling because I didn't know that that was what they were doing. But I became 
super anxious. I was stressed out about the fact right. that I just like asked yes. this lady to death. You know, it, it but was... But that's kind of the opposite of Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter because there is no world building. It, this is like your normal mundane sitting, the guy right. sitting in his apartment, going and getting it's, a drink. I mean, that's... But I guess what I'm, just, what I'm is, saying is in Tolkien where you have to like learn the language and learn the... Right. Yeah, and then then you can you can really experience the story more in your subconscious than in your conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that's that's really like... I mean, that's basically like getting hijacked. Yeah. No, it is. I mean, it, fuck that guy. Well, so, no, yeah, I, I, well, he's no, trying no, to hijack people. Right? But so many good stories are that way. So many good stories yeah. are, the ones that stick with you are the ones that hijack it's you. It's true. Emotionally. And usually not it's good art. necessarily. It's yeah. good art. It's, it's like, good art. And that's not an intellectual thing. That is a psychological trick, right? And that's... To me, that's more akin to the, um, you know, pop culture almost because it's a feeling, it's fleeting. Whereas, you know, with intellect, you need the history, you need the backstory, you need the world, you need the context. Pop culture doesn't need any of that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. right. And, that, an and that's where feeling. J.K. Rowling took something that is similar in its, you know, its framework mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and made it. And put it through the pop culture totally machinery. Totally. Like any teenager or any preteen could understand who Harry Potter was. And unlike Frodo, who's what, like 30 something, I think Frodo's like a Jesus um, archetype, right? Seriously, he's like 33, <laughs> I think, when he starts. But unlike Frodo, who makes this journey that's more geographic, Harry Potter has this journey that's like, you know, kind of it's growing into maturity. It's more psychological and very emotional. Much so. Very much and so. And yes. developmental. Developmental. Which yeah. I think that when you, like, and that's kind of what, you know, that pop culture is about, is that developing along with everybody else. Yeah, you know, it's like because it's taking a ride. more, uh, you're, you're kind of condensing mm -hmm. something into rightfully what it is and, and then just, you you don't have to go through the steps of like stages. Yeah, the, I mean, the, yeah, the instruction manual of like you know what it yeah. has to be. You know what I mean? But and but I think that that's where also like so what's the reach? Like a lot of people have said, um, Harry Potter is superior to Lord of the Rings because it has such a bigger reach, which is a little unfair. Because... Well, and people say the opposite. Like I, a grown man, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna name any names. <laughs> it's one of my friends. Um, who will probably who watch be this? And, yeah, better subscribe. And, yes. Um, and I say this with the utmost love. And you respect. know, we're we're you know we're at their house, and we're somehow we get in the conversation of Lord of the Rings versus. Uh huh. See, Harry I told Potter. you. And major and, geek battle. Oh it my gosh! All and the he's time. totally into Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, he's taught my daughter how to play Dungeons and Dragons, oh, which no. you know, last thing she needs. Which I don't even know <laughs> if that's necessary. I mean, no. like, I I almost think it would be better if she learned how to play poker. She can make money that way. Yes. I mean, honestly. Yes, I agree. So, Life I skills. don't know that you can make money with playing. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, maybe. Not really. I don't no. know. I mean, well, you can you can become a video game maker and then right. you can make lots of money. But sure. That, yeah, I, I don't see that a, happening. No, no. But, uh, yeah, but so. anyway, so he's getting in a full blown heated argument with my daughter, who's You've got 12, a lot of passion that regarding comes yeah. that, that Jay. R.R. Tolkien is superior to J.K. Rowling because he was an intellectual. He was a professor that studied the history, and he actually believed that. And I'm not going to argue with him because he's, you know, because he, rest he, in peace. Right. Um, he, he actually believed that that was real history, and he. Do you think so? I don't. I mean, I don't know. Like when you're writing books and you expect people to be speak the language of the characters, like right. you might actually believe it's the history. So yeah. he was arguing that that it was more superior because it was more intellectual, and he was a professor at Oxford. And and I, think I that has and I don't no think that has because importance. Yeah. he was like he you know he developed that at Oxford, and I was like so yeah, but I went to UC Santa Cruz. And we had a class called <laughs> knitting. The, no, no, no. We we had a class called the Anthropology of Born Again Religion. Wow. So we read books like Left Behind, oh, 
I mean, talk about like, oh, like that making be, you want to drink. Oh, we should have a whole. Oh, we could do a podcast on that, but I don't make know. Make you want to drink. Kool-Aid. I mean, I don't even know <laughs> what we drink could drink. Kool-Aid like, drinks. we would have to drink like we would have to do shots of something. Of Kool-Aid, because, I'm telling you, it's like total Jonestown shot. Oh my gosh, oh, I mean, that's terrible. So anyway, I'm sorry I was for like, anyone who's I was like, by that. how can you, how can you say that just because something comes from a college professor, yeah, it means that no, it's that it's Python. more prestigious because. Right. In my opinion, you know, the anthropology of born again religion. No, I mean, I took the class. No, no offense. I, I wish I had. I it yeah. was it was absolutely enlightening. Enlightening. Wow. However, you can make up any class you want to teach as a professor. Of you, you can, can. make of it up. You can, can be like the anthropology of you know wooden floors. I mean, you can do whatever you want. If you're a it professor, a con- people are going to listen to you. It is a construct. Well, and there's yeah, and there's I guess there's no. A- yeah. No, but anyway, I think there's like I'm a rambling. rambling. No, I, well, I'm just fascinated by that, what you just said. Mm-hmm. I think that what you just said about if you're a professor, you can teach any class you, you want. I think that, you know, I'm a PhD and I have a PhD in something that's completely bullshit. Um, <laughs> I do. In medieval saints. So if anybody wants oh, to know anything about medieval need- saints, I'm your chick. But I think that what happens is people look at PhDs or professors and they go, oh, this person's clearly an expert. And you can spout out any BS you want. I mean, you and you're can... going to get so much more respect and people are going to listen to you and pay attention to you. And I think that there's a certain responsibility in that and a little bit of danger because, I you mean, know. you could go and say, okay, I want to teach a class on the sex lives of... You know, I mean, well, my daughter's taking a class like that about human sexuality, and she's like, Mom, the things I'm learning, I'm like, Great, don't want to know. But I mean, imagine the professor who approached the school and said, Yeah, I'm the expert on this, and I'm going to discuss right. it. And all of a sudden, they're responsible for everything that these young people are learning and thinking about. And I just think that's and massive. that's the difference. I would mm-hmm. say J.K. Rowling is like, Hey, I have a great story, mm-hmm. it's, it's coming from, I would almost argue, like a more pure place of just I simply have a story Storytelling. To yes I, I just want to tell my story tell. for sure but then oddly enough then JK Rowling actually had that much more impact just from having written the story when she did when there was more social media you know more like movie making was a much more immediate yeah. thing I mean mm-hmm. when when J.R.R. Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings and the Cimmerillion other things I can't pronounce anyway all of those books like <laughs> they just didn't have the special effects in Hollywood to make those movies. So they had to be made much later. By the time they made them, his family said, well, either we get to decide on every detail in the movie or we don't want anything to do with it. So his family stepped back, whether- Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason that, oh, I remember now the reason I was having this discussion with my friend Uh was that this the the director my we watched the lord of the rings Mm -hmm. and the director there's an after part where they talk with the director and the director said when he was a kid Peter jackson right Peter jackson he says when i was a kid i used to read these books over and over and over again and i used to think to myself i can't wait till they make the movie Uh and He's like, I had no idea that I was going to be the person to make these movies. It's inc- that's incredible. And then I think about my daughter, and she reads these Harry Potter books over and over and over, and I think, Poor why thing. would you do that? Made. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do? But I think, I think, well, again, it, you know, because of what we do in this show is we we try to relate it back to a creative life and, and how you or, make those or, choices or, in your and, creative life and, and is it useful sometimes to do something over and over and over and hone your craft totally. well if you look at peter jackson like he's a great example of the intellectual way of doing things mm-hmm. he nerds out on everything oh, and he he's got, got those books hundreds of times oh yeah and he but he's got such a range in his projects he just made that uh, movie about uh, world war one is it World War One? I? I don't know. I, I haven't seen it. I'm it's and it, it's it's incredible because he actually was obsessed with the World Wars. Yeah. And looking at the old films, which he totally nerded out on. Oh, And was looking at how they were made and how the experiences of these soldiers were. And apparently this movie, I mean, some parts of it are a snooze fest, but some parts of it are incredibly valuable as a document and as an exploration. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very intellectual. It's kind of... And I, you would say, I mean, my first reaction is to say it's completely different from Lord of the Rings, but I think it's actually very similer mm. in the way he made it by with obsessing. His, with his obsession. And that's, yeah. 
I think what we see in our kids is this, I mean, I don't, I obsess on certain things for sure, mm -hmm. but I, there's we value in it when you yeah. just, you, you just completely go deep, what we call the deep dive. You mm -hmm. go deep into your subject totally. and you want to know everything about it. You know? And so that takes us to, so we're, we're our whole creative happy hour. We've been drinking so much that we're like, oh, ah. is it quite now or maybe not? <laughs> but, um, but I think that that takes us to our homework assignment where the deep dive versus that impression of, oh, I just experienced this in the immediate and I really want to Expand do something it, about yeah. it. And, you know, so how do you, when you have a creative project, when you have a creative goal or something that you want to do, we're going to challenge you guys to have that immediacy. So kind of document the immediacy of what makes you want to do something, mm -hmm. but then go do the deep dive that's going to give it that, that, you know, context and that breadth and that yeah, sophistication. Yeah, do the research. Look at it mm -hmm. historically. Where does it fall in the history? You know, what do you know about its past? Uh, you know, what can exactly. you bring forward that that, that resonance? There's, totally. There's like a historical resonance that comes forward. How totally. Can you, and how can you re inform it completely and like what have other people done that's vaguely similar or that's on the same subject mm -hmm. and that's going to help you as a creative to differentiate yourself so much because the more you know about the background mm -hmm. of what you're working on like you you know with your knitting that you've been documenting yourself so much but what i love is because since you have i mean so i'll take the example mm -hmm. of micah here so fiber frequencies so mm -hmm. a she's doing a first of all it's very immediate what you do mm -hmm. but then you do after the fact or kind of during the fact this nerdy deep dive into the past and the present of knitting and where it is right now right and about oh, the totally. materials and everything else i love it but then you have added in this other nerdy geeky dimension oh. which is your obsession with quantum physics and with auras and oh, with yeah. energies auras and, with and energy and... i mean like Absolutely. i could be a crystal healer but i just don't even believe in crystal healing <laughs> But this I hate is, it when that happens. I know. It's just like, wait, I'm a crystal healer and I don't even believe in crystal healing. No, I do. I believe that we do have energy fields and I believe that we're experiencing them all the time. Completely. And completely. when I make a fiber frequency, I think it is somehow drawn from that experience. And, and I do sometimes, you know, I'll be driving or I'll be in the shower or whatever and I'll see... I'll see something, but I see it in colors. Right, totally. But see, okay, so you take your knitting. Tons of people are knitting. Tons of people are making things every single day. Tons of people are making things that even maybe somewhat resemble what you're making. Sure. Tons of people are crystal healers. Tons of people are doing <laughs> I don't Reiki know about tons, and looking. Oh no. Oh, okay. There's okay. a lot. Okay, we're, we're in Northern in California. California. There's just there's some crystal healers. Right? So yes, we feel yes. like there are a lot of people doing. And if Reiki you're a crystal and... healer, please call us. We love you. Call us. We and... I need a crystal healing actually. Totally. We and we and. As we start to move forward and have our guest stars and our interviewees and all that stuff, Lord, we want to have anybody and everybody. Like everybody. we respect, that's it. like we respect all of these things for what they are. Like we we really love do that. We're not going to be mocking anybody for what your creative pursuit and no, we're mocking is. ourselves. I mean, if all there's the any mocking, it's always it's, it's on always us ourselves or each other. Always, it doesn't matter one or the other. But, and then, so you've got a ton of crystal healers, you've got a ton of Reiki practitioners, you've got a ton of people who are interested in quantum physics, but rare are the people who combine the two things. With, yeah, no, it's right? true. Like, I don't really care so much about patterns, mm -hmm. although I would argue that- You see them really, everywhere. Once you, <laughs> no, once you start reading mm -hmm. knitting and cro crochet patterns, you'll be like, oh, this is the original coding. Why do, right. you know, why do coders get so much attention? Like mm -hmm. knitters and crocheters were the original coders. Oh, when so you much. read some of those patterns, it's like, it, it, it'll blow your mind. You, I mean, it's a secret language Completely. and you actually have to decode it to make a three dimensional object out right. of string it's so with sticks. It's so complicated. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's unreal. When it's unreal. It. Yes. Like when you think about and, and it doesn't get the credit it deserves. Totally. The, the next thing that I feel like is really, really important is mm -hmm. I want to know what it does to the brain. I want to know what knitting Completely. does. Like, I want my brain well, scan when like, I'm knitting a fiber frequency. I want your brain scan and then my brain scan because that's the other thing. It's like just because it works for you and that's something that you get into that zone. I mean, yeah. I know that my brain on knitting is a very stressed out place. And it just doesn't <laughs> It is. Work. I mean, she comes to my knitting circle. <laughs> yes, and it's a mess. 
And whereas for me, I get into my zone with painting or with writing where I don't even see the time go by. And it's something that's much more in tune with my brainwaves. And, you know, I think that that is a magical thing for me. It is. Is it taking, is. you know, something that's so abstract, you know, in your mind, you're painting with words and that when you're writing. And for me, that's where I nerd out and go, wow, how did people do this in the past? And that's another thing where you can't, just because you're looking at what people did and you had a lot of geniuses and intellect mm -hmm. who came before you, you do not need to be like, oh, I need to write exactly like Dorothy Parker or I need to think exactly yeah. like this person or knit like this, you know, amazing dude who used to knit like a machine. Okay. But you take that influence and there's a little nugget that you can take away from that deep dive where you're like, wow, this really transformed this concept for me. And this made me into somebody who is a very unique being producing something that has a very unique little flavor. Yeah, you're a yeah. collaboration of the history of where you came from, your legacy, and your your future manifestation. I mean, it's it's really, I mean, the, all of these creative activities, just mm -hmm. to bring it to you know quantum physics, is it's about getting your brain out of these like very basic thinking modes and more into your subconscious, more of your creative mind, so that you can create more of what you want in your life. Exactly. And I mean, we, this yeah. podcast is born is that, out of that. Of that. And experience. then us mixing together and of drinks help and cosmos. Everything. I mean, drinks help everything. Drinks lubricate the whole. Especially process. mixing them together you in a bucket, the, which is kind of yeah. Right. The, the bucket, <laughs> you know, the the. Yeah, double double mixes. I mean, always. That's we recommend. And when them. you add vodka to dilute the color because you did natural yes. cranberry, that's just not something you want to do in the future. <laughs> no. <I'm> just, <laughs> but now we know. Now that we did that deep dive, now we know Sometimes it's not you just have theoretical to do it. anymore. Yeah. So that's it, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank for you for joining happy us. Hour. It's been a very happy hour. It has been a very happy <laughs> hour, and we cannot wait to see you guys next time. We have we decided on the drink that we're going to be doing. Oh, we'll figure it out. We don't need to even do it that way. No, we'll, we don't. We'll... But you guys know your homework. You have you your guys homework. and gals know your homework. Exactly. You and... need to figure out where you stand between pop yes. culture and intellectual. Exactly. Don't forget. Don't you want to forget hear it from you. Exactly. Subscribe, comment, do all that cool stuff. We cannot wait to see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.